Hey everyone. Hi. Hello. I'm um, just having a tad bit of trouble getting in, so I am troubleshooting that right now. Hi, Jeff. Good. Oh, excuse me. Good afternoon. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Hi, Jeff. It's Jill. Yeah. Hi, Jill. How you doing? Good. I'm still playing. So they won't be able to see us during the press conference. We'll just be talking. I think that's probably what Kasira is troubleshooting right now. Because um, I put on makeup for nothing? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I'm not troubleshooting anyone's cameras. I'm just trying to get Isha into the room. <laughs> oh, uh, we actually have a message, Kasira, when we try to turn on video that says the host has stopped it. Oh. Yes, I see that too. Hello. Hi, Charito. Hi. Thanks for keeping us from the road. I know you're uh, out and about today. And, and they have to help me to get in. It was uh, scary. Let <laughs> <laughs> me just a second while I see if I can edit the video permissions. on expanding the right to vote here in the state of Delaware. I think many folks are aware uh, over the last few years, there have been uh, a number of setbacks, both in the legislature and in our courts that have uh, held back some really important advancements to voting rights. And, uh, you know, we believe that Delaware is the first state and we should also be the first state in access to the ballot. And uh, our organizations have come together and said that uh, what is needed here is a long-term focused campaign uh, to move forward our voting rights laws to make sure that every eligible voter is able to cast a ballot and to do so securely and accessibly. Uh, so we're here today to announce that campaign. Uh, this campaign is bigger than you know one piece of legislation or supporting one bill but we are really recognizing that we are in it for the long haul, that we're gonna be pushing for changes to our constitution uh, to ensure that people can uh, uh, utilize various forms of early voting, that we don't have restrictions on people who uh, uh, may have had contact with the criminal legal system, and that people will be able to utilize uh, registration a lot more accessibly. Uh, we're going to do that in a couple of different ways. We're going to use the ballot box. We're going to uh, educate voters on the positions of their candidates. We're going to be lobbying, doing community education, legal advocacy, and much more to achieve our goals. Uh, we have a really great selection of uh, civil rights and civil liberties advocates here today. Uh, we have Andrew Bernstein, who is the uh, Posen Voting Rights Fellow with the ACLU of Delaware, who is going to be uh, leading much of this campaign for the ACLU. We have Jill Itzkovitz, who is with the League of Women Voters and has been a, a great advocate for them on voting rights issues for many years. We have Jeff Raffle, who is the president of Common Cause Delaware. And we have Chirito Cavacci Mateco, who is the uh, leader of the Votamos We Vote Coalition. So you're gonna be hearing from each of them about why these changes are so important and why they're uh, joining our campaign today. So with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Andrew. You're gonna hear from each one of our panelists. And then uh, at the end, we'll have a few minutes for any questions and answers that 
uh, folks who are attending uh, want to ask. So with that, I will turn it over to Andrew. Thank you, Mike, and thanks everyone for being here today. Uh, as Mike said, my name is Andrew Bernstein, and I am the Cozen Voting Rights Fellow at the ACLU of Delaware. Delaware was the first state to ratify our country's constitution over 230 years ago. Delaware subscribed to the famous preamble, we the people, and what Delaware signed on to was not a perfect system, as many people were disenfranchised at that time, but a commitment to develop the project of American democracy, to improve and make more representative our systems of government. We are here today because that commitment is at a crossroads. Delaware is backsliding regarding equal access to the ballot. Due to partisan gridlock and lawsuits, Delaware has gone from a trailblazer to the back of the pack. Delawareans do not enjoy the same voting rights as most other state's citizens. Delawareans cannot cast a ballot away from the polls on election day without an excuse. Delawareans must register to vote farther in advance of election day than most voters in this country. Delawareans can be totally disenfranchised based on their felony convictions, even after they have served their time and returned to their communities. And now Delawareans may not be able to vote in person before election day. Taking all of this together, Delaware's approach to these voting laws resembles those states, remembers, resembles those in states such as Mississippi, Mississippi and Alabama, states with deep histories of voter suppression and racial injustice. This backslide is not only a symbolic betrayal of Delaware's commitment to democracy, it has real world consequences for countless people. Voters from historically marginalized communities, voters who defend our freedoms overseas, and everyday voters who simply do not have the time or resources to figure out a system that is very confusing and not built for them are all negatively impacted. Furthermore, our valued election administrators are also negatively impacted by these uh, restrictions on voting. The pressures and perils of election day are magnified for them when all voting can only occur on that day. So what do we do at this crossroads for democracy in Delaware? Like Mike said, the ACLU of Delaware believes that it is time for a constitutional amendment campaign which expands and protects the voting rights of Delawareans. While we believe the current state constitutional text allows for many of the reforms we seek, the mere fact that this is and has been up for legal debate is unacceptable. Delawareans want to be able to cast ballots early, whether in person or by mail. Delawareans want to be able to register on election day, and Delawareans want their fellow citizens, including those returning to their communities after being incarcerated, to be able to vote. This campaign will ensure these aspirations become reality. We will work with coalition partners, politicians from both parties, and grassroots informers. Like Mike said, we will be at the legislature and at the ballot box. We're inviting uh, all those running for office, incumbents and challengers, to firmly commit to the reforms we seek to make and we will ensure that the voting public is aware of those positions. We will not endorse or oppose candidates as the ACLU of Delaware, but we strongly believe the public should know the positions of their candidates and then vote for the person who best represents those ideals. It is our hope that candidates from across the political spectrum can unite and endorse these basic and vital dem democracy reforms. Our campaign will support efforts that seek to pass constitutional amendments that meet the standards of expanding or protecting access to the ballot. We welcome conversations with any legislator who is interested in advancing these reforms. We will also organize in the community to ensure this is a campaign powered by people, pushing for reforms that they need based on their lived experiences and ensuring that every voter can cast a ballot. Democracy will win in Delaware, and when democracy wins, everyone wins. Thank you for your time, and I will be passing this along to Jill now. Good afternoon. My name is Jill Itzquitz and I'm with the League of Women Voters of Delaware. The League of Women Voters encourages informed and active participation in government and works to educate voters and provide them with election information. The Delaware League used to be solely invited by organizations just to register Delawareans to vote. This has broadened considerably in the last four years. Now the League is invited by many different organizations, such as churches, schools, and community groups to educate Delawareans on how to vote because it's confusing. During the pandemic, we educated voters on how to vote by mail. In early 2022, we explained and promoted early voting, communicated that their voting location and representation may have changed due to redistricting and outlined how to vote by mail. In October of that year, we had to quickly 
re-educate voters that voting by mail was ruled unconstitutional and was no longer an option. We had to further explain that you needed to an acceptable excuse to vote absentee and re-emphasize that their polling place may have changed. Voters seemed angry, confused, and frustrated. Now we're in 2024, where rules for voter voting in the primary may be different than in the general election, and that early voting may, na- may not be an option this fall. Also, since many voters go to the polls only during a pres- presidential year, they may be unaware that their polling place has changed. It will be difficult to explain to these voters that the only option they have when voting is to go to the polls and they cannot vote by mail like they did in 2020 and they might not be able to vote early like they did in 2022. The potential removal of permanent absentee voting is extremely disappointing to us at the league. Since 2010, we have worked with nursing homes and the disability community to obtain permanent absentee status for these individuals. So they automatically receive a ballot in the mail for each election. Many of these individuals are not tech savvy. So requesting absentee ballots each year could be difficult for them. The removal of permanent absentee voting also affects our military families. It will also be confusing since the the rules are different for school board, primary, and the general elections. The league now has the nearly impossible task of possibly educating the 20,000 permanent absentee voters of these changes. The league enthusiastically supports the constitutional amendment campaign to expand and protect voting rights in Delaware. This will make Delaware's voting process more consistent and easier to understand. More importantly, increasing the ways we can vote will make it accessible to all Delawareans, especially those that are traditionally underrepresented or underserved. The League values bipartisanship and believes that the freedom to vote is a nonpartisan issue. We encourage both parties to work together to ensure that Delaware voting rights are expanded and protected for all citizens. Thank you very much. I'm going to hand it off now to Jeff Raffel from Common Cause. Thank you, Jill. Common Cause Delaware is in our sixth decade of citizen action on behalf of open, honest, and accountable government that empowers everyone to make their voices heard and make democracy work. Founded in 1972, Common Cause Delaware is part of a national organization over one million strong and has played a leading role in passage of many democratic reforms in Delaware. Common Cause has helped to write and support legislation in Delaware on topics such as campaign finance, fair and transparent redistricting, ethics, freedom of information and other transparency efforts, and of course, voting protection and voting rights. For democracy to work well in our state, we know that we need voting to work well. Common Cause has been working to make voting fair and more accessible for decades, ensuring encouraging all eligible Delawareans can and do register and vote. For example, in 1993, we led passage of Delaware's motor vehicle, motor, excuse me, motor voter law, linking auto license registration to voting registration before the national mandate. In 2018, when Delaware was purchasing new voting equipment, We monitored the progress of the Voting Equipment Selection Task Force and educated the public about the need for backup paper ballot voting system. In 2022, we implemented the first ever election protection field program in Delaware. It's most unfortunate that nationwide, due to a variety of factors, including the evisceration of the National Voting Rights Act, the big lie about the 2020 election and partisan posturing, the forces of voter suppression have made it harder, not easier, for much of the public to be heard. 
Delaware is not immune from this troubling trend. While Delaware may be the first state to have signed the Constitution, Common Cause is concerned that Delaware is on the way to being the last state to have early voting. Early voting is an essential voting option that gives voters greater access to the ballot box. With the recent ruling, we're at risk of joining just three other states, Alabama, Mississippi, and New Hampshire, that do not offer any early voting options. We're also disappointed to see the revocation of the permanent absentee voter list, actually, as Jill has explained. This list is primarily used by overseas military members and disabled Delawareans, two categories of voters that we should be encouraging to participate in our elections, not denying the option that works best for them. It was just a few years ago that Common Cause held an event to compare Delaware's voting laws to that of the much maligned state of Georgia. The speaker from Georgia made it clear, Delaware was far from the first state in voting accessibility. In fact, on many dimensions, embarrassingly, it was behind Georgia. In a modern world where Amazon delivers purchases in hours, sophisticated computer systems check your identity in microseconds, and voter mobility is the rule, not the exception, it's time for Delaware to bring its constitution into the 21st century. Common Cause seeks to reduce barriers to voting and increase opportunities for eligible Delaware voters to cast their ballots in the manner that works best for their lives. In the wake of recent anti-voting uh, voter litigation and legislative gridlock, Common Cause Delaware joins with the ACLU and the Delaware Voting Rights Coalition and others to defend access to the ballot box through a long-term campaign focused on updating the first state's constitution to ensure voting rights and, De and Delaware voters are protected. Thank you. I'd now like to turn it over to uh, Torito Kalachi uh, for her remarks. Thank you. I am Charito Calvacci Mateiko, the chair of the Thomas Weibold Coalition. The significant barrier for the Latinx community in the USA is the cultural, the structural barriers surrounding the exercise of the right to vote. When we come to the United States, the country known as the beacon of democracy. We just assume democracy will just get even better. Yet, reality sets in when we are faced with an experience of democracy that is culturally foreign to us, with voter suppression that we are not used to. Instead of having robust, early voting options, including vote by mail. We face here in Delaware the need to find time on a work day to vote. Instead of greeting familiar faces from the neighborhood at the polling places, here we find very few Latinx people are polling place workers. And we are received with sometimes hostile faces even with insults, yes. Instead of our government automatically putting our name in the election register, we have to register ourselves and do it within a specific deadline or even sense a need to organize voter registration to plead our fellow citizens to participate in democracy. Delaware has gone backwards by not facilitating its residents to register on election day or voting by mail. Additionally, with so much social media misinformation and the absence of, in Spanish, robust political culture of issue discussions, it is nearly impossible to judge and form critical assessment of who and what is on the ballot. Nevertheless, Benjamin Franklin's words help us to draw some hope. Quote, you have democracy if you can keep it, end quote. 
That's what he said. So we have to keep it. The silent giant, the entire Latinx community can participate in democracy. Eligible voters can participate in ineligible voters such as the undocumented community can help the eligible voters go to the polls, taking care of the children so others can vote. The vote of one Latinx citizen is the voice of million voiceless undocumented immigrants. This is the belief of the Potamos We Vote Coalition I represent here. Yes, we have to keep our democracy. We have to be clear, we have to organize, we have to analyze, and we have to expand democracy with people's power. Thank you very much. And um, um, yes, I would like to pass to my back again. Thank you so much, Charitho. Uh, and with that, I do want to uh, hold for just a second. Um, we are gonna open it up to questions uh, in a moment, but our last panelist has been having a little bit of problems logging on and I'm told he may be joining us in a moment. Um, actually, while we're waiting for him to come, I did already get a question from a reporter via text message. Um, so Andrew, I'm gonna voice that uh, for you. Um, they were wondering if you could talk a little bit about what are some of the specific policy uh, pieces of the Constitution that we're looking to change. Can you describe those for us? Sure, and uh, thank you for the question, and thanks, uh, members of the media, for being here. Um, specifically, I think we heard today that we're, we're looking to expand early voting options for individuals in Delaware, uh, specifically with regard to both in-person early voting and uh, voting by mail, um, and, and expanding that in a way that voters will not need an excuse to be able to uh, access those methods of voting. Uh, additionally, we're looking at making uh, voter registration deadlines more friendly for voters, um, in particular, uh, pushing for same-day registration. Uh, and finally, uh, we're looking at criminal legal uh, reforms that we can make that, that make voting uh, more accessible, uh, such as removing uh, Delaware's felony disenfranchisement provisions, such that uh, people who are uh, no longer actively incarcerated uh, while serving a, for a felony conviction can vote upon their release, whether that be community supervision, parole, or whether it be someone who is now permanently disenfranchised due to uh, having a permanently disenfranchising uh, conviction, getting their voting rights back, uh, just just outright. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, so we are still uh, waiting one second for our last panelist, but I do want to go ahead and open it up to anyone else that may have a question. Uh, we, if you do have a question and you're in the audience, you can choose to. Uh, raise your hand, and then we will uh, allow you uh, to speak. Um, we also have the Q&A function as well, so you can type a question in the Q&A uh, down at the bottom. Um, one other uh, uh, question, um, and maybe this is for any of the panelists, uh, can you all talk a little bit about what goes into a, a constitutional amendment? How, how does one happen here in Delaware and why is this such a long-term commitment? I'm happy to take that if no one else, uh, sure. Um, so the constitutional amendment campaign process in Delaware um, is, is a long-term process. Um, it requires a supermajority in both uh, chambers of the legislature um, across consecutive legislative sessions. Um, so, for example, uh, we are closing out on a legislative uh, session right now um, for a constitutional amendment uh, to pass uh, that was introduced. Now, it would have to pass by a supermajority in both chambers this year and then post-election in the new legislative uh in the new legislative session in 2020, following the 2024 election, it would have to pass by supermajority again. Um, so this is a long-term campaign because that's obviously a, a steep mountain to climb. 
Thanks so much, Andrew. Uh, so I see another question in the Q&A. Uh, they're asking uh, whether or not there's already a constitutional amendment or a bill introduced that would uh, provide for a constitutional amendment to allow no excuse absentee voting. Uh, Jill, do you want to take that one? Sure. Um, there, I think if I remember properly, there is a constitutional amendment to just take the restrictive absentee voting language outside our, con to, to take it out of the constitution. And then there will be a subsequent bill um, to um, amend the absentee process. It doesn't, it, it doesn't change it within the constitution, it changes it outside the constitution. So it's a little different from what we've been talking about. Thanks, Jill. Uh, next question I see in the Q&A, um, what are some of the arguments against these changes? Why, why is anyone opposed to um, expanding the right to vote? Who would like to take that? Yeah, uh, Jill? Um, we've have had many discussions with some of the uh, moderate Republicans who are for expanding voting rights, but they didn't like the way uh, the Democrats have done the process. They wanted to change the Constitution and leave it in the Constitution where the other bills um, protecting our voting rights they would take it out of the constitution and make it in bill format. Does that explain it? Anyone else? Yeah, anyone else would like to add to that? I, I can add a little bit to that. Um, I think there's also, I think this was referenced in some speakers remarks that there's a, a national political environment component here um, that fortunately in Delaware, usually we are able to insulate and you know use our uh, our decorum and our ability to, uh, you know, be to rise above that kind of Washington D.C. negative discourse. I do think, unfortunately, it has infiltrated uh, discussions on voting rights here in Delaware. But we're hopeful this campaign uh, can be part of a unifying force to to bring back the kind of common sense reforms that we know enjoy support among the majority of Delawareans, and in some cases, supermajority of Delawareans. If I might add to that, uh, we did have a constitutional amendment passed by one General Assembly, and I believe this would have been the second one to pass it, but there were two uh, members of uh, one of the parties, you can guess which one, uh, in, the, in the House of Representatives who switched their votes. They were supportive before. Uh, I'm optimistic because I think like maybe some other policies of late, once the reality hits the voters and they see all that they're now going to be restricted in certain ways or not have the opportunity to vote by mail, as an example, uh, there will be a good deal of unhappiness. And I think polls show that indeed the public, the public uh, in Delaware as well as across the country, is generally very supportive of having other opportunities to vote. Uh, so we'll have to see as push comes to shove uh, and as this gets in front of the General Assembly and the public, how, uh, how strong this uh, pro-accessibility uh, um, political force is. My, my belief is it's very strong, but we'll see. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, I would just add uh, a little bit more on to what other folks have said in that, um, you know, again, the the changes that we're asking for have been embraced by a majority of the country in most cases. Uh, states uh, across the country who that are blue, red, and purple have implemented a lot of these changes and they've done so 
securely uh, while you know protecting the right to vote. Um, and so we believe Delaware can do that as well. And so we are really hopeful that uh, we'll be able to, you know, rise above whatever, you know, partisan fighting there may be going on in Dover around these issues to do what's in the best interest of the voters. And I think that that's also important to remember is that this is in the best interest of every voter. All of these changes have been found to benefit voters across the board, um, that uh, uh, whether you're a Democrat, a Republican, an independent, uh, or some sort of third party, you do like to vote uh, and have the option to vote uh, by mail if you so choose or early in person to have a little bit of more flexibility with the registration system and that people of all political stripes can be caught in the criminal justice system. And so, uh, you know, all of these changes are important are gonna benefit people um, no matter what your political persuasion are. And so our campaign is aligned to making changes that are in the best interest of all voters. So I, uh, we're still unfortunately having some technical um, uh, issues with our last uh, panelists, but I do see another question. So there is another one here. Uh, is there a process or challenge, or do you believe that an all new set of arguments will be made against legal voting, even if rights are, uh, I'm sorry, even if even if rights are added through an amendment process, do you believe you have the ability to secure the supermajority of votes, especially given those representatives do not ha uh, uh, have respond to the concerns of those who cannot yet vote, such as uh, people with felony convictions? I going to try to address that. I'm not sure. And if I don't address every part of the question, I, I apologize. Um, <laughs> I'm just making sure I understand that. I, I think the, the a big crux of the question is um, what opposition uh, is going to exist during, after the campaign, what do we anticipate there and how, how are we going to go about that? Um, I think something uh, critical to what we're doing that I don't want it to get lost in this conversation today is that our campaign will be out in the communities, educating voters, uh, talking to them about these changes. Because I, I think, as has been said by some of the panelists, voters who only check in during presidential elections may not even be aware of all of these changes yet. And uh, we think that engaging uh, with these constituents uh, and letting them know about what's going on, what this election is going to look like versus past elections, uh, what will be key to uh, galvanizing support. Uh, we know these reforms, like I said before, have majority and even supermajority support in some cases. And that's in an environment where, uh, frankly, the conversation has been uh, pushed more by those who are against these reforms than uh, those who are in support of these majority positions. Uh, so we anticipate uh, with this kind of messaging, community engagement, uh, community organizing, that we can uh, kind of take back the reins on this conversation and uh, move these popular reforms. Um, and th there will be opposition, we're, we're well aware of that, but we, we think we'll be ready, uh, working in coalition with with great other civil rights leaders in the state to be able to meet the, those challenges. If I might, here's a short answer. Number one, the organizations involved today and in the Voting uh, Rights Coalition are organizations that get things done. And number two, when you take uh, rights away from people, as we've seen recently, they don't like it. And I think you're gonna you're gonna see a strong uh, uproar when people find out they can't use a number of the uh, methods uh, to vote that they've had in the past. And I want to add that um, I'm happy to report the Republican um, members of the House have initiated a bill HB 320 to change the constitution so we can have early voting. So um, I'm, I'm an optimist, so I'm optimistic that uh, some of the Republicans will, will join and we can get a bipartisan change to our constitution to expand voting rights. And uh, last thing I'll uh, add on to all of that, there was a question around, you know, are, are 
folks going to listen to people who might be disenfranchised right now, really speaking to folks who are in the criminal legal system? Um, you know, I would say, of course, voting is a really important part of participating in our democracy, but it is not the only way, right? That people can exercise their voice by testifying, by reaching out to their legislator, by demonstrating in public, uh, by telling their story um, out there in the media or the public. And so, you know, we at the ACLU and all of our coalition partners are really committed to folks who have uh, been involved in the criminal legal system and amplifying their voices to speak to their direct lived experience. And so even if they are a person who might be disenfranchised right now, it doesn't mean that they're powerless and that we're going to help those people uh, speak and advocate for themselves as part of this campaign as well. Uh, with that, do we have any other uh, questions? I'm not seeing anything new coming in the Q&A or anybody raising their hand. So I want to thank everyone for coming today. I'm so sorry that uh, the chapter president from the NAACP was not able to be here, but don't take that as not, as a lack of enthusiasm for our campaign. It's more of a, he was having technical issues today. Uh, but if anyone has any follow-up, um, any reporters, I think you know how to get in touch with our communications team. Um, thank you all so much for joining us for this really important special announcement. And we're looking forward to fighting with you for these uh, critical uh, voting rights here in the first state. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.